<laughs> well, <laughs> what can I say? I, I never get to hear that because that happens when Glenn is here. And um, so Glenn said to me one time on the phone, he said, he said, they'll, you know, just ask them to do it, and they'll do it sometime when you're down here. And they did. Thank you, Bob. Kathy, um, appreciate that. <clears throat> yeah, I, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't do that kind of thing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, it's not one of my gifts, right? We... And God has given us gifts accordingly, and um, I guess if they're all in music, then where would the preaching be, and the other way around as well. So, thank you again, Bob, Kathy, and Henry, and all the rest of you that have um, lifted our spirits up to the Lord this morning in praise, and and we've come in from the cold world, I don't mean temperature-wise, and it's been cool outside too, but we come in from a world that um, is not where we are, and they don't love the God that we serve and love, and, and so we need this. We are not supposed to forsake our assembling together, and you're not. You're coming, and you're allowing the, the Spirit of God to fill you and move you and prepare you to go out the door again, as I've already seen, enter to worship and depart to serve, right? And uh, we're in a worship time right now. And uh, so, well, I'm always, Elaine and I are always pleased to be a part of this with you and feel privileged that have the opportunity to open the scriptures with you again today. And uh, you see up on the wall there, the theme for this morning, God's determination for our salvation. And uh, right beside it is the cross, the old rugged cross. <clears throat> I... To that cross we will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. I'm not always so glad that we do that, but it's a hard thing. But um, do he cause us someday to our home far away where his glory forever we will share? Well, God's determination for our salvation Many Christians, I feel, don't look at it that way. They don't really sense and, and feel like, like God is just really for them. They almost get the feeling sometimes that some Christians feel like God is just kind of waiting to pick on them. They kind of watch and wait till they make a mistake and then pop them on the head or something, right? Uh, there's this feeling by many Christians that, that God is kind of a legalist, that he is just kind of with his eyes narrowed, watching carefully that if we make any mistakes or blow it, then he's going to do whatever he has to do, right? And maybe we get some of that from the Old Testament as we read those stories, and um, you know, if they obeyed, they were blessed. If they didn't, then then there was curses that followed, and maybe that's an influence on some Christians' lives. And they feel maybe like God is still operating that way today, and we're walking on eggshells, right? Like, again, you walk very carefully or else. <laughs> now, in this sermon today, I don't want to take away our responsibility in, in living our lives for him and and as Paul said, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, actually. There is that part of it. But I, I want to today to help us to relax a bit in the fact that we are God's children, that he loves us, as we've sung about and talked about, 
Great is his faithfulness. Um, every day his mercies are new, and that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to emphasize today. And I hope that when we leave here today, we will feel relaxed in him and confident that he is for us and not against us. You know, why, why are we still here? 6,000 years of give or take of world history. Somebody calculated, and I don't know how they could come up with this, but they come up with these statistics sometimes. Someone calculated that there was only about 8% of the 6,000 years that we've existed on this planet that were peaceful, that were really good. What, 8% of 6,000 would be, what, 480 years. <laughs> that there was actually peace on the earth as God would desire it to be. Well, if, it's, if it was that bad and that brief a time that this world and the people in it lived the way they should live, and 6,000 years later we're still here, that's saying something about God's determination for our salvation. That's saying something about God's patience. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, Peter said, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That is another demonstration of God's determination for our salvation. God is patient. He is waiting. He keeps on. In fact, you think about it. Noah, it said 120 years to build that ark. And it says in different places how God waited, how God waited patiently while Noah was building the ark. In another place, it says that, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah wasn't just a carpenter. He wasn't just out there building this huge ship. And if you'd been down in Kentucky and saw a replica of it, uh, one and a half football field lengths, it was a big project. 120 years. He wasn't spending all his time doing that. The Bible says he was also a preacher of righteousness. He was preaching to the people of his day while he's building the ship. Interestingly, God knows everything from the beginning to end. God knew that only Noah and his family would go in. What if there had been a big revival and thousands of people would have been saved and had to go into that ark? That wasn't the preparations that was made. It was big enough just for all the animals and bugs and birds and whatever all went into that and Noah's family. But the point is that during that long period of time of building that huge ark, Noah was preaching and God waited patiently for it to be done and gave the people the opportunity to go inside with Noah, but they refused to do it. God's determination for our salvation, I love that. I, I rest in that, and I hope that you are too today and that you will. Um, you know, the New Testament, I mentioned the Old Testament, that um, if you obey, good. If not, bad news, right? In the Gospels, we have a, a different approach, obviously, we're under a new covenant. And under the new covenant in the Gospels, we know that God so loved the world, as we read in that scripture, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. A.J. A.W. Tozer said this in an article that he had written. He's been gone already since 1963, but he wrote quite a few books, and uh, one of the things he wrote was this. 
He said, how good it would be if we could learn that God is easy to live with. That's, that's a point I want to make today, that God is easy to live with. Jesus said, didn't he? Come unto me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come and see. Well, Tozer put it like the, in these words, how good it would be if we could learn that God is easy to live with. He remembers our bodies and knows that we are dust. He may sometimes chasten us, it is true, but even this he does with a smile, the proud and tender smile of a father who is bursting with pleasure over an imperfect but promising son and daughter who is coming every day to look more and more like the one whose child he is. Some of us, he says, are religiously jumpy. Can you tra translate that one, Brian? They are religiously jumpy and self-conscious because we know that God sees our every thought and is acquainted with all of our ways. We need not be. God is the sum of all patience and the essence of kindly goodwill. We please him most, not by just trying to make ourselves good, but by throwing ourselves into his arms and with all of our imperfections, believing that he understands everything and he loves us still. You like that? A.W. <laughs> Tozer wishes that we could understand that, believe that, somehow accept that, and live with that in our everyday lives. Well, I want to go back to the beginning for my message today. Um, back where it seems we need to go to um, kind of get a handle on this. Back where it all started. Back where the problems all began in the first place. The very familiar story of Adam and Eve there in the garden. And just want to look at it in, in, three, in three ways. One was God's requirements for them back in the garden there. And then... Of course, there was failure and there was judgment upon them, but then there was God's determination for their salvation. So again, just look at this familiar story and go back there and see how it all began and, and how God in the very beginning already was determined for their salvation. Um, Let's look at, um, we're given five things that Adam and Eve were given to do. And as you know, one thing they were told not to do. So let's look first of all at the five things that God gave Adam and Eve to do in Genesis already chapter 1 in the first account of creation and verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them, and here it is, number one requirement, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Okay, the second thing, we go down to verse 28. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Okay? And then again, it says, Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Number three, we get to verse, chapter 2 and verse 15, where God said to Adam, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Work. There's work to do. 
And this is where we make our case for work and say work is not a curse. Work came before the curse. Work is a blessing. And it's true that most all the work that human beings do contributes to other people. We go to work and we help to provide for other people in thousands of different ways. So right in the beginning, the first thing, one of the first things that God said, or the third thing on our list, was he was to go into the Garden of Eden to work it and care for it. The fourth thing is in verses 19 and 20 in chapter 2. The Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. He was very creative. As they march by him, I imagine one by one, lion, tiger, elephant, dog, cat, you know, immediately I believe he had a name at the tip of his tongue that he could name all these creatures. So that was the fourth thing. And the fifth thing was in verse 24 of chapter 2, where he simply commanded them to get married. Right. Now, if you're here this morning and you're not married, it's not a curse, because we know that Paul said in the New Testament, many thousands of years later, when the gospel was to go out to be preached, he said, it's better if you remain like me. Paul was single at that time. Some think he must have been married because he was part of the Sanhedrin. But at the time that he wrote 1 Corinthians 7, Paul was single. And he said, better you be like me, so you're free to go out and preach the gospel. So if you're here today and you're single, you're doing better than I did, than we did, than some others did, right? So, but in the beginning, obviously, if there was not reproduction, we wouldn't be here, and God wouldn't have his purposes fulfilled in populating the earth and have people to love him and serve him and so forth. And so that was the fifth thing that I wrote down that was a requirement that God gave to them. Of course, you know very well the one thing that they were not to do. Again, in chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17, God said to Adam, he was not yet created, right? He said to Adam in verse 16 and 17, Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Do you see here how easy God was to live with? A.W. Tozer said, I wish we could feel and sense how easy God is to live with. That article I just read. Do you see in this, in this one thing that God said to Adam, you cannot do one thing was eat from that tree in the garden. Doesn't that tell us this morning that God was easy to live with? God did not want Adam and then later Eve to trip up. The place they lived in was perfect. God wanted it to stay that way, right? He wanted them to have a good life. He is for us, not against us. He is for us. He wants to have a good life. He would that today his place would be a perfect place. And don't we wish it was a perfect place to live? Don't we get tired of the violence and the sickness now that's a part of it? And the prayers that were prayed here about those who are ill and, and so forth. And so God made it so easy for them. Just one thing, Adam, just one thing you cannot do, you dare not do, or else there are consequences. Some people, they wonder why there was any requirements at all. You've heard that discussion. Why did God ever forbid Adam and Eve 
to eat from that tree. Why wasn't it just a nice big free-for-all? <laughs> Why did there have to be a no commandment? Don't do this. Then there would have been no violation, right? And there wouldn't be sin in the world, and we wouldn't be where we are. How do we know this morning that God loves us? Already we had, we had John 3.16. That's, that's the biggie. That's the one that really tells the story. That's the one that, that has the most clout when it comes to what does God think of us? For God so loved the world, he gave his son, right? Paul says someplace that he gave us richly all things to enjoy. We know God loves us because of all the things he gives us, the food we're going to enjoy after this service is over here this morning, uh, the friends we have, the blessings, the entertainment, the, whatever it is, the things that we enjoy, and we have much of it here in America, is obvious that, and it was quoted, I think, in, I mean, Henry's prayer, that every good and every gift from that comes down from God is, is, is good. It's, it's good. And there's no variables, no shadow of turning. He doesn't change. He changes not. Always he's in for our good, right? The next question is, though, how does he know we love him? If, if, there, were, if there were no requirements... How would God know that we love him? If there was no way to choose to obey or choose to disobey, how would, how would we show our love to him? Didn't Jesus say, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is proof that we love someone when we keep their commandments. The story of Abraham and Isaac, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's ideal for this particular illustration. God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, go up and offer him up as a sacrifice. You know the story. He took him up on Mount Moriah, built the altar. Imagine he tied his son up, laid him on the altar, raised his hand with the knife in it, and just in the split second before he lowered the knife and sacrificed his son, you know the story. God called out, the angel called out and said, don't do it, Abraham. There was a ram caught in the thicket. Now, God said, now I know that you will not withhold from me even your own son, your only son that you have. It comes across as God now satisfied that Abraham really feared God to the point of offering up his own son and that he also loved God, and of course he proved his obedience to God by giving everything he had, his own son. And that, of course, is what God did for us when he gave his son. So if there was nothing to obey or disobey, how in this life would we go through it proving our love and our allegiance to God? Well, unfortunately, there was failure, as you know. You get to chapter 3, and we have the account given there in verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining knowledge, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Why? Did they eat it? You can be sure of one thing. They didn't eat it because they had to. They didn't eat of this forbidden tree because there was a food shortage. There's projections of food shortage in the world globally. We see some empty shelves in our stores, and we're wondering what the future may hold, right? And we know countries and poverty and food shortage and... Thankful for many ministries that are taking, you know, food into areas to feed people that don't have enough. In chapter 2 and verse 9 says, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. 
trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and so forth. So it says he made all kinds of trees. I, I went online to see if I could find out how many trees God made. And, of course, they didn't know and they didn't try to tell us. But it's just all kinds of trees were made in the garden. The garden was full of trees. And it seemed like every one of them had delicious fruit on it. But in the middle, there's this one tree only. Like we said, God made it easy. Only one that was not supposed to be eaten of. Why did they do it? Can we get around the fact that it was just simply disobedience? Disobedience. We know why they were disobedient, weren't we? And this is not just to pass the buck, but we know that pictures show that guy coming slithering down the tree, right? The serpent. Peter says that he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. God who is determined for our salvation has a counterpart named Satan who is determined for our destruction. <laughs> Just as God is bent on saving us, Satan is bent on destroying us. In fact, Jesus said something interesting in, I think, John 8. He said that from the beginning... Satan was a murderer from the very beginning. And I have to think, well, I guess that's always the way Satan was, and that's the way it was. But oftentimes when we talk about the first murder that's in the Bible, we point to Cain, right? Chapter 4, Cain rose up and he killed his brother Abel. Bad. He killed his brother. The first murder in the Bible. But was it? Wasn't Satan the first murderer when he tempted, when he lied to, when he led our first parents to reach up and take that forbidden fruit? Wasn't that in a sense, that, that was murder. When that happened, we died, all right? God said, you eat of it, you will die. Satan knew that. Satan enticed them, led them, convinced them, lied to them. And I say that Satan was the first murderer, as Jesus said. He was a murderer from the beginning, beginning of time. Well, judgment came. Judgment had to come because God is just. We have... In um, chapter 3, verses um, 16, down through verses 19, after the failure, in verse 6, we have the judgment beginning in verse 16. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pain in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it. All the days of your life I will produce thorns, thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, from dust you are, and to dust you will return. Wow. To dust you will return. It is just like God said. You eat of it and you will die. Satan lied and said, you won't die. God knows that when you eat of this, there's a benefit. Your eyes will be open. A part truth, right? But the judgment came, and judgment fell. Now, notice, and this is a little bit hard, I think, for us to understand, but when this happened, it was not a matter of Adam and Eve violating their conscience. All right? Today, we people that have a conscience, our conscience does a lot for us, to tell us what is right and what is wrong. This happened 
first. They took of this before their eyes were opened, before they knew good and evil. They, they didn't even know what evil was yet. This is still early on in the game, right? This is before they had disobeyed. They were still innocent. They were still in their purity. But they heard the words of the tempter, Satan, coming to them in their pure state, in their state where they had no idea, no conscience of right or wrong. They just heard Satan say and lie to them, and they listened to him, and they disobeyed, and they took it. I say that because people today, and maybe I hope you haven't been there, but people today, they say, you know, I just don't have a conscience against doing this or that, right? Um, and so they, they go down that road and they do this or that, the wrong thing, when it's recorded very clearly in the scripture that they should not be doing what they are doing. Now, there are some things we say in the Bible that are negotiable, right? That, that you may... You may take it one way, and I may take it another way. But there are black and white rights and wrongs in the Bible that we know we can't negotiate on. We must take God at his word. And so whether or not we have a conscience against something, if the Bible says it's wrong, then we don't do it. And if that had been the case with Adam and Eve, who didn't have a conscience yet, Adam knew. Eve wasn't back there at that time. Adam knew, and apparently Adam did faithfully convey it to Eve, because Eve is the one talking to the serpent, and she repeats what God told her husband before she was even created. So we know that Adam told her the situation with that tree in the middle of the garden, right? So they knew that if they would take of it, they would surely die. Don't do it. And even without a conscience against it, they took it anyway. God's determination for our salvation. It's a bad situation. Judgment came. We're still suffering from it. We're still dealing with the thorns and the thistles. We're still sweating. Uh, we've been sweating the past few weeks. It's been very hot, and uh, we know about heat. And I think we can assume by that that the climate back in Adam and Eve's day, in that perfect setting, the climate was perfect. It would have had to been good because they didn't have any clothing on, right? Right in the beginning, they were naked and they were not ashamed. And so it wouldn't have been 35 degrees out there, and it, wouldn't, it mustn't have been 90 degrees and humid because they weren't sweating. They were taking care of the garden, and they weren't perspiring until this all happened, okay? So, um, anyway, God's determined for our salvation, as we know now, did not include physical death. Um, we know... We're getting older. We know, Paul said, we're wasting away. There are funerals continually. We all, as far as we know, recorded, there's only two people who ever got out of here alive without death, right? We, Enoch and Elijah. There only two people recorded in Scripture that didn't have to die. Enoch was 300. He walked with God, and he was not. God took him. We don't know how he took him, but we know how he took Elijah in that chariot of fire with Elisha watching him. Otherwise, Paul talks about the last enemy to be destroyed, and that enemy is death. So death, death is, is that which is still very real. When even God in his determination for our salvation is, has not promised and is not keeping us from physical death. It's spiritual death. It's the more important death, actually. It's our soul's death. It would be our permanent separation from God that God is determined to save us from. And for that, we thank him this morning, and we are grateful, okay? 
So in Genesis chapter 3, again, in verse 21, we have this. The Lord God then made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. We know he took off what they had made back in verse 7 in chapter 3, where it says that, the eyes of both of them were open now, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. But we know without the shedding of blood, 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 <laughs> the cross, blood, animals, thousands, millions of them were sacrificed prior to the cross. We know that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. It just didn't cut it when Adam and Eve got these fig leaves and put them around and tried to take care of their sin problem with fig leaves. <laughs> that didn't work. God had to take an animal, kill it, shed blood, and cover their sin. You know what? that first animal that died in the world, the first animal to die was not for food because they weren't eating meat yet at that time. That came after they came off the ark. They were vegetarians. Maybe some of you this morning are vegetarian. That's what they were. So the first animal killed was not for food. It was not even for a sacrifice to God. It was chapter 4 where it's recorded that Abel, the good brother, he had flocks and he would offer up an animal for a sacrifice. But this is back right after the sin occurred, right? That God took an animal and shed its blood. God's determination for our salvation, the first animal to be killed, was so you and I could be saved. Not physically, we will live our lives and we will need to get to the end of life and like all flesh. It's the way of all flesh, David said, or Solomon. But when it comes to the spiritual life, not being separated from God, God made preparations and he started it already back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. You know, some say, and I'm not sure we can prove this. I looked at the scripture here, and we can't prove it otherwise. But some tell us that God actually did this the same day they sinned, the same day they took of the fruit. And if you look through the chapter, through the chapter here, it could possibly be that he'd wait, he wasted no time in making provisions, in having that first animal killed, <laughs> so that our souls could be saved. This was in preparation for the one who was to come. We know Genesis 3.15 is pointing to the time when the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. But if you think God was quick in doing all of this on the same day, Peter is one up. Peter says, don't you know that before the creation of the world, already <laughs> Jesus was the lamb who was slain. Now you talk about determination for our salvation. Before anybody even came to be in the mind of God, they must have had a conference up there in the throne room of heaven, right? And it was decided and foreordained that Jesus, the Son, would come and do on that cross exactly what he did now, 2,000 years ago. Wow. He made it easy. One thing not to do, right? He's patient. 120 years that Noah preached patiently, not willing that any should perish. Again, I love what A.W. Tozer said, God is easy to live with. He is for us. He is not against us. He is so determined. Somebody wrote a book, The Hound of Heaven. A hound. He is hounding us. He is after us. The scripture from Genesis to Revelation is showing God's determination to save his people. 
But unfortunately, so many, broad is the road that leads to destruction. They don't heed it. They don't want it. They don't want to bow their knees to the Almighty God, even though Paul said one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That's a scary part if you aren't ready for it. But, as was read again in John 3.17, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. I love that. Come unto me, all you laboring are heavy laden. Again, Matthew 11. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, and I am easy to live with. Period. I'm going to close with this little clipping that I always appreciated so much. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So that's why God send us a Savior. Thanks be to God. Father, we thank you for that incredible plan before the creation of the world. Somewhere up there in the throne room of heaven, it was preordained because of your foreknowledge that your Son, whom we now know to be the Lord Jesus, was already slain in your mind before one of us came to be. What a determination for our salvation. We take all that to say, to God be the glory. The love of God is greater far than a tongue or pen can ever tell, the songwriter put it. It does go beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. And we are the recipients of that. We are the blessed ones for it. Bless this congregation as they continue to serve you. May they relax in your love and in your grace, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.